So um, I put this little title that he was a visionary and he was a diplomat. Um, he knew so many people and he supported many people. So um, he was what we call in English, the bee in a number of people's ears. And he really gave a lot of support in addition to making his own work. So um, he has been studied and it's exciting to hear what is going on um, around the symposium, how much scholarly work is happening. And I think um, there will be a lot of new breakthroughs in the understanding of Peck's work through the scholarly research. So we all know that Peck was born in 1932 into a prosperous soul household. He passed away in Miami at 74. Um, he got his BA in aesthetics from the University of Tokyo, where he wrote a thesis on the composer Arnold Schoenberg. And it was one year later in 1956 that he moved to West Germany, ostensibly to study music history with composer Theos Herbiolis Georgiades at Munich University. So it was while he was in West Germany during this early period that he met and associated with the composers Karl Heinz Stockhausen, John Cage, and the conceptual artists George Machunis, Joseph Boyce, and Wolf Rostell. So these artists, like what Pick would go on to do, was quite challenging in the interpretation of what is art. They all were crossing and doing inter interdisciplinary work. I always say that Peck was peripatetic, meaning he was very comfortable out in the world. And he would say to me that came from his Mongolian roots. Uh, so let's go another slide or two, please. So these are just some shots of him at um, uh, a monitor as he's doing some processing up in the left. There he is in the studio of public television station WNET with the engineer, John Godfrey, David Loxton, um, and Charlotte Mormon is with him. Then down below his wonderful friends, John Cage, Allen Ginsberg, and Merce Cunningham. Next, please. So he was very interdisciplinary and he was very much of a thinker and he had many talents and we say in English, he wore many hats. Next, please. What we don't realize early on in the mid late fifties when Peck was in Germany, he actually did a bit of travel. And I think it's fascinating to know that he made it up to um, Stockholm to Filkingham and he performed. And there he is performing with an, with an audience in front of him. He was an in, incredible performer. He understood time. He really understood how to hold an audience sort of in his hand. They would always be kind of breathless wondering what he was gonna do next. Um, so at Filkingham and at other events is where he exchanged ideas with lots of um, colleagues. So there were a couple of times in the um, 60s when Peck went back to Tokyo and one was in 61 and he visited a very progressive art center called Sogetsu. And it was founded a few years before by the Ikebana master Sofu Teshigahara. And that was later um, headed by his son, um, Hiroshi Teshigahara, the filmmaker who introduced French new wave cinema and Cage's music to the avant-garde artists in Japan. And it was during this time at Sogetsu that Peck met and went on to develop a friendship with the artist Yoko Ono and other artists um, in Germany, in Japan, I mean. So returning to Germany is where he really then developed um, a little bit more of his um, performative practice. So here he is in that image, uh, performing Zen for Head, 1962. He interprets a Lamont Young composition. And um, so you can see him, he puts his head 
in a pot, it could be um, ink, and he uses his head as an ink brush. Um, so he did not perform that uh, alone in his studio. That's in um, 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 for a small audience. Next, please. So I think one of my wonderful colleagues will probably be talking about pigs Zen for film. He was always taking material, thinking of how to work with it, how to explore, how to use it in a very minimal way. Sometimes he went um, very Baroque with it, but this is very, very minimal. He's working with um, a blank film, running it through the projector again and again and again uh, as an exhibition. And then of course it got very grainy and um, scratchy and that became the imagery. Okay, next please. And I love this work. Pick was really a lot about sound. And I think he, like artist Billiola and others who were very influenced by him, they under, he understood um, a lot about sound. And he also loved to play with the treatise that stuff, the stuff that you would think would be thrown out. Um, like in this case, it's just a bunch of objects that are hanging and you, the viewer, or the listener would have been able to go and interact with it. Next, please. So this is one of his first exhibitions, Exposition of Music and Electronic Television at Parnas in 63. So he's again playing with material there. He's put um, tape on the wall. Um, it's actually audio tape. Um, next, please. And, you know, the whole idea of technology, here we are, he made actually his first robot in 64. And um, thinking, you know, it's really a very crude little um, personage. Um, it's um, dropping little pellets. It's um, got little sponges for breasts that are moving around. Um, so it's very, he had a wonderful sense of humor and irony. Um, next, please. He was in Tokyo, and if you know your Japanese contemporary art history, the Hyde Red Center was a very um, kind of very avant-garde political group, and they were preparing their shelter plan and taking individual artists, very carefully calculated measurements, and so that then um, in case one needed to have an individual nuclear shelter. Okay, go on. So Paik um, arrived in New York in 1964. He chose to live downtown. Um, and it's not surprising that it was near, uh, right on Canal Street. And this is where hardware stores were in abundance. And they had all kinds of weird stuff that they had out in front of their shops. So it's not surprising that Paik would kind of roam around and find material. Okay, next please. And he very quietly, actually, while he was still in Germany, was collecting old TVs. So the idea that the television was um, in um, a middle class or an upper middle class household, but the more upper class ones, the bourgeois ones, were then buying a new one and they would put out on the street the old TV and Pake was the one who started to take them apart and tinker with them. And he was doing that kind of quietly uh, on his own. Um, and then next please. So then he's tinkering, next please. So then he's working away and then he creates um, objects. Next please. So this many of you have seen um, his TV magnet. And I joke that it was interactive art before there was a name for it. So the viewer initially was able to move the magnet on the top and create their own composition. And of course, once that goes into a museum, it's impossible for you, the viewer, to do that because then it becomes a very important object. Um, so perhaps what the curator will do is play a video alongside to show you what the manipulation would look like. Next, please. Again, him in the studio. Next, please. So he tinkered and 
he's often thinking about time and he's thinking about um, the technology and about nature. And in a very philosophical way, he's saying the moon is the oldest TV. So the moon, we know we read the moon, we know when it's full, when it's a snippet, when you know it's different times of the month. So here he's created 12, he put 12 monitors, and in a way it's you know the phases of the moon. And I forget this is in at least one museum collection. Uh, next, please. And this particular work I'm very fond of because he's taken the TV and taken all of the insides out and he's put in a candle. So if you know your Northern Renaissance European painting history, that the Memento Mori was um, a painting that often had a candle. And the candle in that case was to show the fragility of life. We're here for a moment. But I think for Paik, here the candle, indeed it's about life, but it's also about television and how, especially not so much now, because most of you in the audience are probably on your smartphone for news and information, but then the TV was this big, big source of information and um, knowledge was coming out of it. Next, please. So, um, I was fortunate to see the remake of this performance in 1974 at the anthology. But again, Paik also, he had, you know, played the piano as a child. His bourgeois household had a piano. But here in this performance that he first did in 1962, he's playing with the idea of this cultural object that a child would take piano lessons and learn and play at home. So Paik is performing. And then of course, ultimately he smashes the piano to bits with a big hammer. Um, so he's, he's, he's always challenging, always questioning. Uh, next, please. So once Paik was asked, how did you learn video? And he replied, I invented it. I finished with electronic music, therefore I had to do something. I was neither a good painter nor a sculptor, neither nor a good composer. So there was no competition at that time for video. So there he was. Okay, next please. So um, Paik got a very modest grant from the Rockefeller Foundation in New York and that enabled him to get his first portable camera. There were a number of other people in New York, artists who did around that time get portable video cameras. Um, uh, Warhol, um, Juan Downey, Les Levine, and Joan Jonas. But it was a time of really figuring out what video was, what it could do. Those early cameras weighed 20 pounds, the take-up reel weighed another 20 pounds. So it wasn't like having a camera in your smartphone. Also, videotape um, was in the late 60s, what we called open reel. So you could thread up the machine, turn your camera on, have a live image, hit the record, and then rewind the tape decide if you wanted to keep the imagery and, and maybe keep it or copy over it and do something else. So next please. So at that time, artists were very much sharing of information, sharing of what they learned, how, what they could do. So I always like to discuss what Paik was doing with um, images on the mass media. So, he took um, images of then um, the US president, Richard Nixon, and he runs that footage through what he called his wobulator and he's playing with it and he's morphing it and he's having a good time, but he's also being somewhat critical. Uh, next, please. So I also like to point out that it's not quite a portrait um, but it's a caricature, you could say. So here he's done the same thing with then 
New York's mayor, John Lindsay. So this little excerpt from a press conference that Lindsay gave, Lindsay is saying, okay, you can start recording. Okay, you can start recording. So it's the, um, the gesture, it's the essence of this man. Um, and I point out only that at the same time, Andy Warhol was taking images of very popular, well-known people like figures like Marilyn Monroe. And instead of doing video with them, he was turning them into a silk screen, a print, or silk screening multiple images onto one canvas. Okay, next please. So Paik um, got uh, money and I wanna um, just give you a little bit of this. Um, so I wanna say that there was a big divide between what was happening with commercial television in the, in the late 60s, early 70s and what was happening with these very scrappy independent artists, how they were working. And Pick was very frustrated that he had just black and white. So with Shuya Abe, they got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation and they were then creating their um, synthesizer. So they worked on it in part out at Cal Arts and they drew upon a couple of students to um, help them, but it was really the work of Peg and Shuya Abe. So I want to say he, there's a funny quote that he made where he said that the students really, really liked the synthesizer, like working with it. And because it was quite rare, we didn't have all of the special effects that you can have with Photoshop now um, that they, um, the students really lined up to work with it. So let's go to the next slide, please. So at this moment, computers were room scale, they were huge and only engineers were the ones allowed to touch them. There were two exhibitions. This is actually the wrong date. It was 1968. There were two exhibitions that happened. Um, it was really looking at the relationship between art and technology. The curator, Yasha Reichart, organized cybernetic serendipity. It opened in London in 1968. In 69, it came to Washington and you know, was shown there. Um, but I want to say that in the catalog for cybernetic serendipity, Reichart says, she shows the optimistic outlook. One cannot deny that the computer demonstrates a radical extension of art and media techniques. The possibilities inherent in the computer as a creative tool will increase the scope of art and contribute to its diversity. But I wanna point out that the show featured the work of 43 composers, artists, and poets and the work of 87 engineers, doctors, computer scientists, and philosophers. So it was an interesting um, you know, survey, but I wanna point out, the, it, there was, I think, a divide between the art side and the, and the technologists. Next, please. That's a room size computer, next, please. So MoMA did a show also of importance in 68 called The Machine is Seen at the End of the Mechanical Age. And again, it was a survey, but this one started with Leonardo, a drawing of his flying machine and went on to feature one of Rauschenberg's so-called combines. Um, um, the exhibition concluded with Paik's Lindsay tape, what I showed you a few slides back. Um, and what Paik did was he, because we did not have um, cassette videos at that point, Paik basically took a slice of a videotape, put two open reel decks on the floor of the MoMA gallery, 
scotch taped the loop and then played that Lindsay tape that way nonstop for two days. The tape broke and then um, it had to be removed. So I just want to say that. Um, I also want to point out that I really love the fact that when you look at the work of Rauschenberg, who was only seven years older than Peck, he had a very similarly bold risk-taking approach to his art. Both Rauschenberg and Peck had a very mischievous streak as well as a very insolent style that enabled them as artists to try to find line between rebellion and propriety. They really enjoyed the freedom of technology derived art as a wide undefined field. So they had a lot of freedom. Um, let me move on. So I wanna just give a quote from Rauschenberg Around this time, Rauschenberg noted, um, see, we had a real divide in the art world. Galleries could not stand art and technology with the exception of someone like Howard, Howard Wise, who had a gallery on 57th. Wise was really very interested in kinetic art, and he's the one who had a very important exhibition in 1969 called TV as a Creative Medium. And Howard Wise connected kinetic art and the art and technology movements with the up and coming field of video art. So I wanna make that point. And then I also wanna say that around this time, it's interesting that Rauschenberg noted, if you don't accept technology, you better go to another place because no place here is safe. Nobody wants to paint rotten oranges anymore. So while Rauschenberg saw a great future, the very elite contemporary art cognoscenti deemed most of the new work a mere byproduct of experimentation, as did many of the newspaper critics who remained very um, uninterested for years. So I think it was um, very important to really think about and applaud Peck for what he was doing and how he, I really think he was a diplomat. He was always talking to people, always encouraging people, always encouraging those who had money like the foundations to put their money towards museum exhibition programs, towards um, lectures and um, things like that. So I have to say that I think it was because of Peck, I, MoMA and I were very fortunate to get an early grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, so I wanna make a point, um, we'll go on. So we'll go on to the next slide. So it was in actually 1971 that the three quarter inch cassette came on the market Sony, I think Philips, um, JVC. Um, and this to me is really what allowed video to become an exhibitable art form. It meant that a curator didn't have to thread up an open rail deck. Um, next slide, please. You could pop the tape into, um, you could assemble what I call them compilation reels. You could assemble a cassette with maybe several works by the same artist and pop it into the machine, have a wall label text and give the times that this work was being shown. And then you had an exhibition. So that's really how I, in that very early year to really put things together. And I call them tape eating machine because they inevitably would just all gum up and grab and make, hay, cause haywire with the cassette, but that's how it was. So um, the cassette meant distribution was really possible. It meant that an artist like Peg or Bill Viola or John Jonas or many, many others could make a work, could put it into a little mailer, an envelope, 
and send it off to a festival in Vancouver or um, maybe Tokyo or maybe Seoul. And then this little kind of underground group that was really following and sharing information, then that's how um, information spread, I think, through some of these festivals. So we'll go to the next one, please. So you could say that early video had basically several formats. You had the single channel video. And I always say that Paik, Martha Rossler, and many other artists of that time were utopianists. They really wanted the work out into the world. They wanted young people like sitting in the audience today now with the symposium. They really wanted people to see the work, to really be able to think about it, to really be able to study it. So this is an example of one of Paik's um, early videos from 1973. It was produced through the public television station in New York, WNET 13. And it's really a wonderful, very colorful, quickly edited work. Of course, this is in this image, Charlotte Mormon. The video also includes footage of Allen Ginsberg reading poetry, um, maybe um, a, a beautiful, wonderful Korean musician is performing. He's got a Pepsi Cola commercial. So he's playing with the very high and the low, but he's manipulated the imagery so that it's very, very colorful. So when WNET 13 aired this video on Sunday night at seven o'clock, if you were turning the dial and you landed on that, it was so engrossing that the viewer would stay. So that was part of his um, point. So the idea too was he was very naughty. Um, so you're watching this video, I think it's 29 minutes. Um, so very much at the end, after you've gone through and seen these, both you know the, the Pepsi Cola commercial, you've seen Charlotte Mormon playing her cello, it's very colorized. And then you see a very exotic fan dancer and he's telling you to close your eyes, open your eyes. So he's, he's, he's having some fun, I say. So let's go to the next slide. And Pick was very clever. Um, he would know the importance of what I call ephemera. He knew that these posters were important for getting the word out. And, you know, he had like every, every artist had a list of people he wanted to know about the work. So he would send a flyer, a poster. And I was the type of person who saved everything. And then um, Paik would come and he would visit me. And then he would come with very early catalogs. He would come with old newspaper reviews, articles. He would sign them like he signed his poster. Um, and he kind of knew that I would save everything and that it being MoMA, that it would be kept in an archive, which it is. So I stepped down from my position in 2013, but the full archive of what I assembled is there in the library, in the special collection, um, in the name June Pig files. So in the six, in, I, I spent time with Paik. I had lunch with him. I would go down to his studio. Um, he would um, entertain me and the musicians um, he knew for dinner. And it was all very wonderful and lively and the sharing of information. So let's see, um, next please. So here we are, we have um, these works of Paik's and I know they're in Seoul hearing from the wonderful um, director who talked about the conservation. We have to be very aware of what Paik's vision was, what his aesthetics, aesthetics were. And as we do the conservation, 
we have to take really great care. Now, when a MoMA acquires a work, usually, not usually, always, MoMA does what's called an artist interview. So you want to know from the artist what's the most important parts, the most important components that really make up the aesthetics of the work. Okay. Um, we'll go to the next, please. So this is just an example of a very early paid catalog. It's designed by him with Judson Rosebush, and it's a fascinating example of Paik and his aesthetics. I know that Electronic Arts Intermix did a republishing of it. Next, please. I don't want to take too long. Just so you know, Soho looked like that in the 70s. It wasn't full of boutiques like it is now. Okay, go on. Um, just next slide. So Paik was very fr great friends with a lot of artists, Shirley Clark, the filmmaker. They did funny uh, campy performance live at the kitchen. Next, please. They aren't kissing. They're, it's a split screen. They're in with two different cameras. Um, so there he is. Next, please. So um, Paik, well, I already talked about Paik and time. Here he is, it's his TV Buddha, a very old classic Buddha, looking at his own image on a very futuristic TV set. So to me, the koan is, what's the difference between a live video image and a pre-recorded one? Um, and there's a very big difference. And next, please. And how do you know if that's a live image? Well, you can put your hand in front of the camera and um, then you'd see that it's either live or not. Okay, next. Um, he was very funny. So this was an installation. Um, you would lie down on the floor. He installed these monitors on the ceiling. Maybe some of you have seen the work. It's um, recreated. So fish fly in the sky. So fish like birds. Go on, next. And then... Pick talked for a very, very long time about doing this work. Um, good morning, Mr. Orwell. So 1984 was going to be coming up. So Pick was, it, we say the word in English, indefatigable. He had energy up the wazoo. He just was so energetic, so pursuing of these very, very complicated projects and fundraising. So next, please. So he really pulled it off. This was a, a global live event, New York, Paris, I think Israel, and there were a couple of other sites. So he had artists performing, um, Peter Gabriel and others. Um, but it was really, really a very challenging event, um, very challenging work and a great success. A great, next please. Another work, um, interesting, those of you who are in a museum, when the, muse new, the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt opened its new building, it commissioned several works. So it came out of the building fund, this particular work. So it was not the acquisition fund, but the building fund. So this is a very important work, his one candle, where he's got, got um, now I'm forgetting, a laser and, it's just the one image, but it's tossed around the space. Uh, next, please. And a lot about time, as always. And then Peck talked forever and ever and ever about the electronic superhighway. So here's his remarkable work that's in the Smithsonian and very complex for him to make, to take footage from the 50 US states, from television, and then create this map and with neon. So next, I'll go quickly because I want to close. Others are speaking. Um, so here, so Rudolf Freeling last year did an amazing retrospective of Pig's work and was very careful about the aesthetics of each of the pieces. I think the San Francisco public um, really appreciated and scholars, I know many um, Pig scholars went to see the show. So um, that's, life goes on. Next, please. 
So there's Paik, um, Paik and his influence. Next, please. Um, we have Web3. It's people talk about it. It's coming. Is it here? Um, next, please. There are artists who I think um, would say Paik was important to them. Rachel Rosen, who works with VR. Here's an installation, very complicated um, and very much um, about media and the world. And I think that's really Paik. Paik was a lot, what's, what's the here and now? What's the world? Who are we? How do we know each other? Okay, next please. Next slide. And then another one, you could say maybe Jakob Kutzinsen, a uh, Danish artist living in Berlin, um, doing a lot also with VR and augmented reality. Next, please. One more. And then Aria Harvey, an artist who's worked with um, the internet forever and ever. Um, so today, artists don't use the porta pack Photographers are using their smartphones, a very good smartphone. And I think this is the artist's toolkit for many who are not painters, um, unless they're working in the computer as a painter. Um, so everything keeps changing, changing, changing so fast. Um, next, please. I think the last image is, where do we go from here? And I think that's probably gonna be talked about today with many of the speakers who follow me. So I wanna thank everybody for being there. Uh, I know you're very patient and it's a long day. So I hope you have the energy to um, carry on. And I'm very sorry I can't be there. Um, I would love to be there with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.